Hello. <laughs> hey, craft beer professionals community. It's good to see you guys. Uh, I'm Lindsay Barr. I'm going to be talking today about some just basic sensory techniques that every craft brewer can use in your facility um, at any time of your in your development process. Um, a little bit of background. Uh, first of all, uh, Andrew, thanks for having me and um, everybody in this community. It's um, really a pleasure to be connected in this kind of unique way. Uh, I'm really excited to start seeing all of you guys again. And uh, at the same time, I'm, I'm thankful for technology to be able to bring us together and um, be able to have these kind of authentic communications uh, through these various avenues. So thanks again for having me. And um, please feel free to make as many comments as you would possibly like um, and ask questions throughout my quick conversation. Um, I really wanted to synthesize down the whole of uh, sensory science and what we should all kind of be doing in our facilities in about 30 or so minutes. Um, so I'm going to touch on a lot of topics and it's a, a bit of an ambitious feat to make. So if, you know, if there are gaps or anything, or if there's anything that you want me to spend a little bit more time on, I'd be happy to do that. It seems like this format is relatively flexible. Um, and I'd be happy to go into a little bit more detail with anything that's on your heart or any, um, anything that you're, you know, struggling with in your facility as well. I'm happy to discuss with you. Um, so I'll talk for about 30 minutes or so, hopefully give you some fodder for thinking about different questions that you may have, and then we'll have a discussion at the end of this. So please use the comments liberally. Um, I'm coming to you from San Diego, California. Um, and I was actually just in New Hampshire yesterday. So I've kind of been um, all about for a little while. Uh, so I'm still East Coast calibrated and feeling awake and alert, even though it's eight o'clock um, on the West Coast. So hopefully we have some folks from the West Coast joining. Um, if so, hopefully you have some coffee in hand and um, you're feeling a little bit more alert and ready to have a discussion. Um, so a little bit of my background. I am a uh, founding partner and CSO of Draft Lab Sensory Software. Uh, we started Draft Lab in 2016. Um, before that, and a little bit leading into that, I uh, worked as the sensory and consumer research specialist at New Belgium Brewing Company. Uh, I was there for almost 10 years and uh, was fortunate to be able to grow up in such a beautiful um, community at that brewery. And I got to learn a lot. I got to try a lot of stuff out. I got to fail a lot. And um, I hope that I can synthesize some of my <laughs> failures and stuff um, in, in conveying some best practices to you today. Um, before that, I was at UC Davis. I um, did my master's degree in food science and technology. And uh, with I studied gluten-free beer with Dr. Charlie Bamforth back in the day. Um, and uh, before that, I studied biochemistry and molecular biology at University of New Mexico. And um, so kind of take a bit of a scientific Chemi chemistry approach to um, how I like to discuss these things. Um, and, you know, sensory science itself is my passion. And I've been able to share that with uh, the broader community outside of beer even. So we've been working with hundreds of companies over the last few years. And um, I've been fortunate enough to be able to see, uh, see how other uh, food products work um, and how other businesses operate. And uh, spoiler alert, it's kind of all the same. <laughs> we all have the same problems. Uh, we're all able to use these same kind of techniques to be able to answer our business questions. Um, in fact, I'm looking over at my counter right now and I have like 30 different rice products <laughs> on my counter. Uh, I'm going to be tasting a bunch of rice later today. So yeah, I mean, this this stuff is, is very translatable to uh, the broader food and beverage world. Um, and uh, and of course, in in beer and brewing, which is also my my co passion, sensory science and beer and brewing. Um, so, okay. Anyway, without uh, <laughs> without going too far into this, I'd like to just go ahead and get started. I'll I'll present some slides, and uh, we'll we'll have a discussion afterwards. So, um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Thanks, Andrew, for putting that up. Um, so today, we're going to talk about sensory techniques that every brewer can use. Um, again, I've been really fortunate to be able to work with big companies, really small companies and kind of everywhere in between. Um, and we've been able to apply these sensory techniques regardless of the size. Um, and we've, we've kind of almost taken this like trickle up approach, <laughs> if that can be a thing 
where uh, we started by just making uh, these sensory methodologies accessible for small companies, but we've noticed that larger companies kind of take note because it turns out all of our business objectives are more or less the same. Um, and so what, what we've learned over the last few years is that, um, that you have to get value from your sensory program from day one um, in kind of the rapid development process with these businesses growing relatively quickly. Um, it's really important that we uh, start kind of getting an ROI on what we're doing. Um, and that doesn't necessarily have to be monetary, even though the sensory program can actually help save you money. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, um, but it's, it's just getting a return on the uh, on the quality control investment. Um, so making sure that you are uh, having products that are going out the door that you can really sign off on and feel good about. Um, so you have to get value from day one rather than having to train a panel and uh, do all of these extra kind of extraneous activities that uh, are very academic <laughs> in nature. They may not necessarily apply so well when you're trying to run a company. Um, and then to just start simply by tracking your tasting data. Uh, if I ask brewers, uh, are you running a sensory program? Many people will say no. But if my next question is, well, are you tasting your beer and making decisions based off of that data? The answer is absolutely yes. And so everybody is more or less doing these techniques. And um, I would like to just talk about maybe taking the extra step of systematizing that so that you can really get the most out of your tasting data and information so you can just become a better brewer. That's what we're here, what's what we're here to do. Um, and the, the program, the quality control program or the sensory program will grow as its value is recognized. And so start small, uh, get some little wins. And as you kind of tack off those wins, you're gonna get more and more support from management and from the community and uh, the you'll be able to put more investment into the program and, and grow it as you recognize its value. And these are all kind of typical, you know, business philosophies, um, but we tend to lose sight of that in quality control. So I think that it's really important to remain grounded in that regard. And it's important to main, remain grounded in our role as sensory scientists in this kind of multifaceted facility that is a brewery. Um, our, our goal, our role is to just quickly and inexpensively provide data required to make better informed product and process decisions. And that's really it. That's what our function is. And so if you think about all of the different customers that we have, we have brewmasters, we have um, maybe sales and marketing team. Um, we may have uh, folks from like the tap room hospitality, or maybe that's like everybody, everybody's the, the same person. We still have these different facets and these different customers that have these questions that can be funneled into the sensory scientists or into the sensory program and your tasters. And our goal and our role is to lift back up the data and the information necessary to inform, to better inform those decisions so that we can keep making the right products and better products. And that is it, that's our role. And so it's really important for us to kind of stay outside of the decision-making process in some ways, because it's really our role to inform better decisions, but not necessarily make those decisions. Um, when I kind of took myself out of the decision-making process at New Belgium, I've got to say that I slept a lot better um, and I, I've got to say that it ended up just working out really well where I could remain objective as a sensory scientist and kind of put myself um, in this position to where I could facilitate questions and, and folly up data that will help us just make better beer. So that's our role in this organization and our breweries. And our business objectives are kind of all the same. And I, I kind of like this, this little kind of funneling um, uh, creative on the side here. Our objectives are all more or less the same and our objectives fuel our goals and inform our strategy of achieving those goals and those tactics that um, are being executed kind of on the ground level. And so I'm gonna go kind of through this process and ground us in what our business objectives are regardless of what kind of facility you're running, be it a brewery or uh, you know rice manufacturing facility. 
Uh, so our business objectives is to create a mix of core, seasonal, and maybe pilot brands. We have to keep our consumers excited and interested in what we're doing. Uh, we need to produce those brands and scale them really quickly. There's really very little room for error. Um, and so as much work as we can do on that front end to make sure that we have a right uh, work is going to end up paying off in the end. And we're all trying to achieve this first time customer experience. We need to get it right the first time. And breweries are really good at that, really good at understanding that philosophy. Um, knowing that, you know, we may only have a handful of opportunities to really please our customers. And so it's important that we seize those opportunities and provide them with something that is consistent and delicious and in line with what their expectations are. And by the way, we're on a budget. Regardless of your size, we are all on a budget. Um, and we're trying to kind of get as much out of um, our investment as possible. And so our goals that kind of support these objectives, just to name a few that I want to really focus on the main goals of many facilities is to one, develop new brands that are in line with your consumer's expectations, what they want, what's going to sell. Um, and then to quickly release those uh, brands to the market. And then we want to also ensure the shelf stability in the market as well. Many breweries have started packaging this year, which is really wonderful. Um, and the, the shelf life thing is becoming more and more of a, a topic of conversation that we should focus on. And the strategy of achieving those goals, which is kind of the mind blowing thing um, that has been many years in the making. And you know, the more simple the model, uh, the, the harder it was to kind of get to that point. But I really do believe that if, if we can break down um, our strategy of achieving these goals in the sensory world in just three de three specific unique steps. Uh, and I call it the rapid sensory quality control methodology. And the first thing is to define your targets. Uh, and we're going to go through some examples here, but defining your targets could look like defining your, your product's flavor um, for consistency and quality control, or it can be defining what your consumer wants. And so defining the target that you're shooting for to develop a new product, for example. Um, in the analytical world, it's easy for us to sit, uh, very clearly see, okay, well, we're defining our target as a 5% ABV beer, plus or minus 0.2%. Um, and so that is our target. In sensory, it's no different, except what we're doing is we're using flavor terminology to set those targets so that we can measure ourselves against that target and make sure that we are um, achieving what is in line with what our expectations are for our, our, our brands. Um, so that is defining targets. Number two is flagging defects. Using that target will allow us to measure our batches against that target so that we can identify inconsistencies. So in the product development world, we can identify if the brand is maybe too citrusy when we are going for something tropical. Uh, in the quality control world, it may mean that our uh, our flagship is a little out of specification because of a filtration issue or something like that. So the third is to identify those issues, to identify um, what is causing us to be out of specification when we do flag those defects, that like small handful of those defects. Um, it, it will allow us to go back and do a little bit of further investigation uh, to understand what may be causing some abnormalities in our product. So those are the strategies. And then the tactics, or that is the strategies, the tactics, the kind of boots on the ground methodologies that are being uh, focused on to achieve that strategy is really just three different sensory methods. If you think about sensory as a whole, there's, you know, uh, I mean, the ASBC has 35 methods or something like that, ASTM around the same. There are a lot of sensory methods that exist and it can be really hard to identify which one to really focus on. And so I just want to draw our attention to three that um, I see every um, every food and beverage organization that we work with utilizing um, most frequently and getting the most value out of. Um, you know, our in the sen in academic sensory world, if you were to pick up a sensory book, you'll probably be inundated with all these different methods, and it can be really overwhelming. And you might feel um, pressured or in, in some ways tempted to uh, kind of do the nitty gritty academic sensory from day one. But I'm here to tell you that um, you're, you can get a lot of value out of, uh, you know, these kind of academic methods, um, but they don't have to be overly complicated and they don't really have to 
uh, they don't require tons and tons of training uh, before you can get value out of your program from day one. As we know, that's kind of one of our first objectives is getting value out of day one. And so these methods, the three that I want to talk about today is the hedonic test, uh, the description test, and the true to target test. So the hedonic test, the purpose of the hedonic test is really just to create consumer driven specifications and to generate brand buy-in. This is a test that is really only appropriately applied at the beginning stages of a brand's development. So when you are when you are creating a brand, a new brand, you're asking subjective for uh, subjective information is valid. It's not necessarily valid in quality control because subjective input is impossible to standardize and you don't want to necessarily standardize it. And so this is really only appropriately used in product development when you're looking at, okay, what should we make? What do we like? What do our consumers like? How do we stack up maybe to the competition? Anybody who has uh, tried to push a new brand through without buy-in from the organization knows that you can end up chasing your tail even all the way through production if you don't have good understanding and buy-in that this is what we're going for because either we like it or we know that our consumers like it. And so this helps us to identify just basically what's liked and how do we maybe stack up to the competition. You execute this really simply. Uh, we're all familiar with the Likert scale, like smiley face, we love it, or ecstatic about it, or like frowny face crying, we hate it. Um, so participants basically select a phrase that best describes their degree of liking. And each of those phrases corresponds to a number that can be used to calculate, standardize, identify standard deviations, means to, to see where, uh, where our products fall in line with other products. So that's the basics of a hedonic test. The second thing, our second objective in the RSQC, Rapid Sensory Quality Control process is to define our targets. So once we know what we want, then we need to uh, define in clear terminologies what we are shooting for. And to do this, it requires a common language. So the execution of this is for panelists to describe the flavor profile using a common lexicon. Um, anybody who's uh, gotten a sheet of paper and a pen and asked to just write down uh, their experience of a product knows how intimidating that is and, and the messiness of that data. And so uh, we like to use a method called CATA or check all that apply that helps you to identify the overlap in the flavor attributes that your panel is experiencing. So you could say, yes, this is the thing that is citrusy and that is part of the target that I am looking to, um, to solidify when I'm producing this product. And so um, when panelists can use a, a common language, it really opens up your data in a way that helps you to um, maybe pivot off of what uh, raw materials you used or to um, just better define uh, overlaps and, um, and identify those, those uh, products that have certain attributes. Okay, so the result is the aggregate of individual responses to find those common flavors. And this helps you to build your brand target. Um, you know, when we started in 2016, it kind of really started with the common language, the beer flavor map. Um, we uh, we lifted up to the, the broader world of uh, breweries in 2016. And this was kind of the response to updating the beer flavor wheel and also making it a little bit more in line with current science and in line with uh, current flavors. Uh, the beer flavor wheel hadn't been updated since the 70s. And so uh, this was kind of our, our uh, responding to the call to action to create a uh, common lexicon that we can all use to define all of our products. Um, and so this is integrated into our technology as well. So that's defining targets. Um, and so some of the description test data value that you can get from just taking the time to mindfully and intentionally generate those descriptions is you get an objective target for quality control. Uh, this target, when you are asking your panelists to create this target, um, they really see themselves in it and they really have a good understanding uh, for what your product is. And so it's created by your panel and for your panel to use as the sample evaluation criteria as you go into production. 
Um, it also includes an acceptable range of variation. With other methods like you know descriptive analysis where you're scaling each and every attribute, there's really no uh, room for error. There's no room for uh, any kind of variation. And we all know in, a, in fermented products that there's a decent amount of variation that is actually acceptable. Uh, acceptable to us and acceptable to our consumers. And so this target can allow for the right amount of variation that is consistent with what your um, objective is for your brand. It can also give research and development guidance. So if you're really conscientious about uh, integrating all of the factors that go into your products and the flavors that result from those products, you can use that to create new and unique brands. For example, if you uh, if you document that you use Mosaic on the hot side for brand A, B, and C, and you always get this kind of mango, tropical, blackberry, maybe aroma, then you could probably deduce from that information that Mosaic is uh, the right thing to add on the hot side if you are shooting for a mango, tropical, blackberry thing, or whatever I said. <laughs> um, so it can help you to guide R&D. So there's a lot of benefit to just doing it, even if you're not doing QC. Um, and then marketing materials. I've seen quite a few facilities that uh, will have their panelists do a description and then they simply just use that information to put on their sell sheets, to put on their website and to put on their tap room menu. Um, anybody who's like sat down with a beer to like generate a, a flavor description for your marketing knows like that it could be kind of, uh, difficult uh, sometimes. So it's it's great to be able to use um, those who are around to um, help generate those target descriptions and um, those marketing descriptions as well. Okay, so that's step one. Step two, flagging defects. So using this information, um, using these targets to flag defects, you execute this simply by <clears throat> by utilizing that target description to identify if a sample is in or out of the acceptable range of variability. This is the test, the true to target test is 80% uh, of the tests that you would run in your facility. And I, it seems like I maybe took 80% out of thin air, but I didn't. Um, I actually looked at a whole bunch of data that we have and it turns out that um, out of like hundreds of the, the facilities that use draft lab, about 80% of the time, the true to target test is like the thing that really fuels the program because you don't want to, kind of give the full runaround with every single sample that you taste because, it's, you know, frankly, it's a bit of a waste of time if most of your samples can just be pushed through and pushed through. Um, so it's, it's, it's hard to kind of spend a lot of time and effort on each and every sample. And so the flag defects, the true to target test is a fast way of just taking that target description that you intentionally built at the beginning of the process and using that as the basis for which to determine if something is in or out of the range of variation that you have deemed uh, reasonable for your product. Uh, so the, the stats are simple, they're elegant. Uh, if you're not even running stats, then that's also fine. Let's say you have five people on your panel and four of them say that it wasn't true to target because of a uh, high citrus aroma. That's meaningful information. We get really bogged down on statistical relevancy when it turns out like we, we can just use numbers to help us to make decisions uh, without giving it uh, too, too, without having to do like the full comb, comb through. Um, all right, so this is the, the true target test. You may, be, you may have heard it from called the in-out test, the go-no-go, -no -go, the true-to-brand, not true-to-brand test. They're all the same thing. They're all binary, is it that or is it not tests that kind of help give you insight into your product. I like the language true-to-target because it's really objective. Um, here's a target, is it that or is it not? And it's not necessarily fraught with making your, your um your panelists make a decision like go, no, go, go. Is it, uh, is it, are we able to sell it and make a profit or no go? Are we having to hold it and dump it and not get the profit or whatever? Like it, it can be kind of fraught if you're asking it in different language. And so I just like the general true to target test. Okay. Uh, so the data value, you're able to quickly release or flag samples for further investigation. The target is really to only take a minute or so on each sample. It's relatively fast. You can recognize quality trends over time. If you see that you have 0% of your panelists saying it's not true to target, and then you get 10% and 20% and 20% and 40%, you can identify those trends um, where you may not have been able to see it otherwise. 
Um, and it also helps you to set best buy dates. Uh, the true to target test can be used for shelf life as well. Um, if you have a fresh target description and your panelists know that this is a shelf life sample, so they've already kind of widened their expectations a little bit. Um, once they start getting to the level where you maybe have 100% of your panelists saying it's not true to target because it's papery and no citrus and whatnot, then that might be a good indication of where you should be drawing the line for your best buy date. So this is really quite flexible. It'll also help you analyze test batches as well. So for example, if you change your yeast strain because you want to kind of take a yeast strain out of your production or, or whatever, um, you can create a pilot batch or maybe even a full scale batch with a new yeast strain. And you can just see, does that, does that sample pass? Does it pass as true to target? Is it within the normal range of variation for our brands? And that is really sometimes like the best way of, of doing that. Um, I know that the the temptation is to do something like a difference test, like a triangle test. But the question isn't necessarily uh, when you're doing these tests, it's not necessarily, is it different? Uh, your question is, I mean, it doesn't matter. Like, is it within the range of variation? Um, it can be different, but still within the range. And so the true to target test best kind of uh, finds those products that are significantly outside of the range of normal variation without being too fine tuned. All right, uh, hopefully that all makes sense. So this is an example down here where you have eight out of nine true to target assessments for aroma. Great, go make it happen. And on the flip side, on the right hand side, you have uh, eight out of nine uh, saying that it wasn't true to target. And uh, you can glean from the comments that maybe you had a hop issue if you had low citrus or just more multi aromas or something. All right, so the goal, uh, quickly releasing consistent beer. So let's bring this all the way through in an example. Uh, defining targets, so the target allows for moderate to high citrus aroma with low bitterness and body. If 100% of my panel said that the sample had low citrus aroma, you can then use that information to confirm your results, A, uh, and investigate the root cause and determine disposition for any future adjustments. As, of course, if you get 100% of your panelists saying that something isn't true to target, that doesn't necessarily need, mean that it needs to go down the drain. Remember, the sensory scientist kind of stays outside of that decision-making process, and uh, this is just information to fuel up. Sometimes it can mean blend. Sometimes it can mean, um, maybe it can mean dump, or maybe it can mean sell um, within like a, a smaller group of people or something like that. Um, a lot of times the sensory program, I'm going to go on a little bit of a rant here, uh, can kind of get a bad rap for just costing money and costing and costing. Um, but I've I've had many examples in, in my time where we've made an assumption that maybe we can't get away with uh, a long fermentation or maybe adding the wrong hops to a beer or something like that. Sometimes we we assume like, oh, I don't know that we can actually sell this because we you know made an error or there was a fermentation problem. Um, but the sensory program can actually um, challenge those assumptions and come back and say, you know what, actually this beer is fine to sell. This maybe blend it or uh, maybe it's fine to sell as it is. Uh, where we may make assumptions that it might not be. And I've, I've seen that quite a few times where uh, the assumption is that, that we might need a dump, but we challenge that assumption by tasting and doing our evaluation. And it turned out that we can actually sell a product that may have been uh, deemed unworthy if we just looked at the, the process data. Okay, so I really quickly just wanted to talk, you know, I tried to keep myself to like 30 or so minutes and just give like best practices. I don't think I did that. But um, one of the questions that I get is like, well, who's your panel? Who um, who are these people that are doing these tastings? And um, regardless of your size um, or where you are in your in your development, your ideal panelist is the person who cares about your product who consistently contributes to the program and is courteous to others. And the rest is honestly trainable, um, but you you can't train motivation and passion. And so if, if you are lucky enough to have a group of people at your facility that are motivated and passionate um, and are willing to consistently contribute and are courteous, that's, you've done your work. <laughs> they've, they've, you, you are very fortunate. The rest is trainable, and um, I'll talk about training it in a minute. Um, a, a couple of best practices when you're recruiting panelists, it's important to keep the opportunity open outside of production. It prevents this 
kind of brewmaster mentality where there's, you know, uh, one person that's making a lot of the decisions, or it, it seems like this is exclusive club. You don't want it to look like an exclusive club. Um, you want everybody to be able to give it a shot. And uh, that can also be really helpful if you have people from maybe marketing and sales that don't really know that you had a long fermentation, then you have a really great unbiased group of people who can add uh, more to the story than maybe somebody who's been on the floor and maybe biased in that regard. Um, and, you know, it's important to generate buy-in and support from the top as well. Um, and that, again, that ends up fueling back as your data continues to help you to make better decisions. Um, and, you know, what motivates a panelist? Um, a lot of times panelists are motivated by different things. Uh, Cheetos is a good one. <laughs> like snacks or whatever is like a really easy, good motivation. Um, so ask your panelists, like, why did they come? Um, it could be because they like the educational opportunities. They like the self-development. They like the community. They like the snacks. It can all be different. Um, and so when you ask them, they'll tell you. And it's easy to just do that thing as a panel leader. Um, and then be flexible, especially now, uh, to use the cliche. Um, panels need to be open for longer. Uh, you can keep them open for however long it takes, frankly, um, as long as you're you're not just spending all day doing panel. Um, so keep them open for longer. Schedule panels in a convenient and central location so that your panelists know where to go and um, just be reliable about it. If you're running panel on Tuesday at 1030, every Tuesday at 1030, be there, be ready and be consistent. Um, you can check out a blog post that I did, I guess not really recently now, but it, it's called Tips for At-Home Sensory Testing um, that kind of go into some ways of doing this um, given our you know current world. All right. Uh, I normally don't really talk about training in these really short format things, but I did want to talk about training just briefly because you guys are all professionals and uh, training is, is a part of what you're probably already doing right now. So I just wanted to lend a little bit of my philosophy on the training framework. So here's the training framework. Um, the training framework is really simple and it, this really goes for everything. You know, I get asked, how do I train my panel for true to target tests? How do I train my panel to identify defects? How do I train my panel for shelf life? The framework is the same um, and it's pretty simple. One, introduce the panel to known standards. Um, so for a true to target test, it could be a true to target sample and a not true to target sample, or when you're trying to help them identify defects, maybe it's a, it's a beer spiked with diacetyl. Um, so introduce to known standards, say this is true to target, this is diacetyl and actually get them familiar with that. Um, and then test the recognition with blind samples. So after they've been told what that is, um, test them then either the next time they come in for a training or within that same day, maybe randomize, reblind or whatever. So test them for the recognition of that blind sample and then calibrate them. So reinforce, okay, that was diastole, that was true target. So reveal the nature of the sample so they can go back, recalibrate themselves and uh, gain that familiarity. And then just monitor the performance in panel and in training settings. And this is really, really important. The monitoring, it helps uh, identify maybe biased panelists. For example, if you have a panelist that always calls out diacetyl in training, but doesn't necessarily on panel, you can be like, tap, tap, tap. What's going on? <laughs> Why are you falling asleep in panel? What is your objective here? Uh, is, there, is there a certain bias that's causing you to maybe push things through? Um, so it, it's important to monitor that performance um, by just simply documenting how they're doing in panel and on training with identifying these, these samples. And then repeat. So there really is nothing that can substitute for familiarity. Um, so this takes repetition. It takes uh, consistent, uh, just consistent repetition to be able to really solidify these ideas. Um, and you can even be intentional about how you choose the samples that you maybe introduce your panelists to. So for example, if you're able to document that your panelists often um, misidentify a one month sample as a fresh sample, maybe give them a one month sample and a fresh sample within the same training so that you can really help them uh, deduce the differences between those two products. So repeat um, in an intentional way. 
Uh, so uh, an example of this is introduce samples that represent true to target, not true to target. This is for a true to target training, which is one of my favorite trainings. Um, just simply trying to show panelists this is what our beer should be, not necessarily like this is what um, it shouldn't be. So this is one of the places that I like to start. Of course, there's value in showing them uh, attributes as well. But um, this is one that you can just do tomorrow because you have all of the products with you. Um, so represent true to target and not true to targets samples, give them those, test them for the recognition for true to target or not true to target samples, then calibrate them by revealing that that was a true to target sample, that wasn't a true to target sample, continue to monitor their performance in panel and on training, maybe give them a not true to target sample on panel one day and see if they can identify it and then repeat those steps and pivot accordingly. So that's the general training framework. Hopefully that gives you just some grounds to run with um, when you look to train your panelists for uh, these different methodologies in your facility. And then I wanna leave you with just a little raw, raw stick with it. Um, you know, you can start now with what you have. You have the people in your facility and people are the best instruments to be able to do sensory analysis. We have our faces um, that we can uh, that we can identify different issues with. Um, so you have your people, you have uh, products that you can use for training, and uh, you can just begin with that framework that I introduced: the defining your targets, flagging those defects, and using that information as a way of becoming a better brewer. Um, and your program is only as strong as your people. So make sure that you are taking care of them and motivating them and, uh, and, you know, building that culture of quality. That's the stuff that really can't be taught, but if you're in a management position is absolutely imperative, uh, to instill from day one and to continue working towards instilling that. Um, and of course we're here to help. Um, you can stay in touch with us, with me, um, in particular, if you want to just reach out to us. We um, love talking through different program problems. Um, we love talking through whatever it is that's on your mind. So you can email me, lindsay at draftlab.com or um, just us generally, info at draftlab.com. Um, I started just holding open office hours on Wednesday mornings. If you have any questions or just want to talk through anything in your program, um, you can check out our uh, check out our website for that We and check out our Instagram posts as well. We have, um, we have a, a space where you can actually sign up for just, just to chat with me and we can talk through some of your problems, um, or just get to know each other. Uh, so, and we're also, you know, active on the social meds. So, uh, hit us up at draft lab and at sample Ox, which is our consumer research platform. Um, and thanks for having me. And, uh, I'd love to take questions or, um, just have a, have a chat. So thank you. Hey, Lindsay, it was an absolute pleasure learning from you today. So I'm going to open the floor up to anyone right now who has any questions for Lindsay. I know she would love to answer them. So get those questions in the comments. And if not, I'm going to throw a few your way because that was really intriguing. I've got some fun things oh. that I want to ask you about personally. It's always fun to learn more about the tasting and sensory side of the industry. Yeah. And with that said while we wait for everybody to type some questions in there you know looking back on the past 15 months i know today is the first day that california is officially opening back up so that's really exciting so stay safe out there and have some fun but you know what are some successful methods you've seen breweries utilize over the past year to run a successful sensory program yeah it's it's a good question um i mean our our image of what is a solid sensory program can look like you know five, 10 people that are in a booth type setting and doing their kind of nitty gritty analysis um, all in one facility. Sorry, I'm getting a little feedback. <laughs> so I'm like, Ooh. so always like, thanks. <laughs> I'm like, ah! <laughs> it's so weird to like hear myself. Uh, anyway, uh, so what what we like to do, uh, or sorry, what, what you tend to see as like a sensory program is like 10 or so people all in the booth setting all together. Uh, kind of doing these blind tastings. And um, that norm, I think, has been challenged. And um, we can run, get valid data and good information by doing uh, maybe roundtable discussions or in the case of where we've been going now, doing at-home tastings or tastings that are asynchronous. Um, and so some of the best practices that I've seen people do is 
Uh, some folks are sending six packs home with their panelists. Some folks are just running asynchronous panels where there's only so many people that are allowed in the in the facility at, at one time. And so um, there's been a lot of flexibility that's kind of been added added to the processes that they've been running. Um, and we've been seeing a lot of success with that. Um, I was just talking to a, a brewer the other day that said that they they were able to validate that the the data that they get uh, when they do at home tastings is just as good as the data that they get from um, in facility trainings or in facility tastings. Um, and so so I think the the main thing is to just be relatively flexible. So keep panels open for longer, allow panelists to to do their their tastings from really anywhere. And if you're using technology to be able to integrate all of that information into one space, it's not necessary that you have that roundtable discussion after you you talk. And that roundtable discussion can sometimes be um, a little bit fraught with um, with opinions and stuff, and it can get derailed relatively easily. So it's even still a best practice to get data, get that objective individual feedback and then synthesize that information. You can do that at different times and use that to facilitate a conversation later. And that conversation, if you need to do a roundtable type discussion, can happen over Zoom. Um, it can you know, happen in a, a bunch of different ways. So I've seen a lot of creativity and um, most of the, the breweries that we've been working with over the last few years were able to maintain a panel during the pandemic, albeit kind of a little bit more bare bones and uh, just a little bit more kind of streamlined and intentional. It's also important to really focus on the, the questions that are going to have the most impact for your facility now. So if your main objective is to release products to, to the market and keep, keep your company afloat, um, then focus on those things. Not necessarily, this isn't like the time to change your yeast strain or to like do nitty gritty shelf life analysis. Like this is the time to just focus on that kind of true to target testing and um, work towards those goals that are going to get you uh, the most bang for your buck, I guess, right now. And you mentioned, you know, objective tasting, of course, that's obviously the goal. Have you found that having these at home panels or doing them through Zoom removes a little bit of bias that you might have from an in-person, you know, sensory panel? It's, it's a really good question. And I have seen that um, it, it doesn't hurt. <laughs> um, I mean, if you're if you've set up your panel to be really respectful for one another and allow for individual analysis to take place first, and then maybe have that discussion and have that be in a really safe kind of open format, then there's probably really no real shift there. Um, but for those panels that maybe had a little bit more, you know, bias and uh, kind of like nudging in certain directions from certain panelists, like I'm sure they've seen uh, a benefit in actually having to be separated from one another. Because uh, one of the best practices is to try to d diminish what's called the halo effect, which is uh, the effect of having one person saying something um, or experiencing something and kind of suggesting that to others. And you end up building this kind of halo around this person. And halo could also mean like, halo as in this person is a better taster and so maybe we want to like follow what this person does so there's a lot of bias that can happen if you're not setting up your uh, norms in your panel to really uh, value individual input and objective input first um, and the you know tasting away from each other hasn't hurt <laughs> That's good to know. We're going to dive into the comments right now because we do have some coming through. And this is a pretty much a direct follow up from the first question we kind of touched on a moment ago. Have you seen any shifts in sensory programs such as new methodologies or focusing on particular tests that you haven't mentioned so far today? Uh, one of the things that I love so much about sensory science is that it's still a relatively new baby science. And, um, you know, perception is really complicated and we keep learning more and more about how we perceive and how bias works and our brains are complicated and it will never, it will never be boring. Um, and so there's always, uh, and there's always like really nerdy statisticians that are looking to like make different tests to kind of like quell a certain bias or whatnot. Um, so, I mean, some of the newer methods that exist right now, um, I, I guess a newer method would be like the, the tetrad test, which everybody kind of now is familiar with, which is essentially the triangle test with one more 
stimulus. And um, that's kind of like the, a, a new thing. It's seen to be more powerful in the beer world. It can, it's maybe not, um, it, it's, it's maybe not the best method to use for like more fatiguing products because again, you have four samples when you're trying to answer a question about one sample. Um, so that could be very fatiguing. Um, but that's kind of a newer method. But as far as like the shifts in programs with, uh, with like the pandemic or the, the shifts that I'm seeing with new methods that are being used, a lot of folks are just going back to kind of the basics. They're recognizing that, um, you know, these nitty gritty methods like descriptive analysis where you're, where you're scaling attributes, um, do have a time and a place to utilize it, but um, they're going to the more simple methods of like just the flagging, true to target, not true to target type tests um, to, to really build the basis of their program. And then they can add some creativity on top of that uh, when they have the bandwidth and when they're already in a cadence where they're answering the basic questions that need to be answered uh, for quality control. And so what we've done to kind of stay up to date with um, how people like to be creative with uh, their their different methodologies of, is we've actually over the last like month or two two couple months time is weird um, we've made different tests that are essentially templates that one could use to um, kind of add their own scale their own numbers their own kind of anchors and whatnot and um, there's a little bit we've added a little bit more customizability in our product to kind of like take note of those little things that people are doing. Um, but the, the basics still remain the same. Like the, the, you know, the really quick flagging methods are what people are really leaning on now. That was a great tie in for our next question. Uh, Becky asked, do you have a sample questionnaire sheet that you would use for the TTT testing you could share? Um, Maybe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yes, it's it's a pretty simple thing. Uh, I actually think that the ASBC, uh, when I was the sensory subcommittee chair, I was was kind of shocked to see that we didn't actually have the true to target test in or the true to brand go no go test as part of the ASBC methods. Um, and so we did write a method for the true to target test when I was the sensory chair, which was a few years ago. It's like four or five years ago. Um, and so there is an ASBC method and I can, um, shoot a link to that. Um, so that's, that's a good one. Um, but yes, it is, it is relatively simple. I really like to break it out into modalities. So visual, what is it that we're going for? Aroma, what is it we're going for? Taste, mouthfeel, and breaking it down to those basic modalities so that you can say yes, no, and really use that information to identify, okay, like to give you a leg up when you're trying to do that troubleshooting. And so if you're seeing that you're, you're seeing a not true target and taste, you can look maybe to your brew house because maybe you, um, or look to your malt or something. Maybe you basically, uh, didn't extract as enough, uh, enough sugars, or maybe you didn't convert your sugars enough, um, in the brew house and to maybe you have a sweet product at the end. Um, so that, that kind of helps with the additional troubleshooting. Um, but yeah, I can, I can shoot a link to the ASBC method. And of course, um, the, you know, the true to target method is integrated into draft lab and, um, that's in the, the, in every tier in the basic tier. Uh, when we were creating those tiers, we really asked ourselves, what are the main things that every brewer can use? Um, and, and the true to target test is kind of at the heart of it. And so that's in the basic tier and it's, um, it's, you know, affordable and easy to kind of bite that off for, for most breweries. So you can check that out. Too. Awesome. Thanks, Lindsay. Now here's another fun one we've got. Consensus seems to indicate that there are indeed six base flavors, salty, sweet, sour, bitter, umami, fatty. Are there any new base flavors on the horizon? Uh, I love that question. Um, first of all, I want to, I want to uh, kind of ground us in like, what is flavor? Um, and flavor is kind of like the overarching umbrella that encompasses uh, aroma, both orthonasal and retronasal aroma, taste, which are the, the you named the tastes, sweet, salty, sour, bitter, umami, and fatty, um, and mouthfeels. And that kind of is overarching flavor. And so the basic tastes are those that you, you mentioned. Um, but, you know, in order to be a taste, you have to 
have a specific taste receptors on your taste buds. You have to have a specific transduction pathway to your brain to the, where it registers as a separate and unique taste. Um, and there has to be a class of effective stimuli. So sugars for, for sweetness and uh, salts for saltiness. Um, so, so there has to be a class of, of chemicals that, that, that elicit that response. And so to say that there are really only six basic tastes is like, I mean, there are six basic tastes that we know of that fulfill that criteria, um, but there are other tastes that I think are coming up to the to the horizon. Metallic is one of them that has been discussed as having a certain class of effective stimuli, certain receptors on your taste buds, and a unique uh, transduction pathway to your brain. So that's one of them uh, that has is being kind of questioned too. And so there's there's some taste research. Uh, out there that is kind of looking to to identify those different tastes, but um, but I'm, I think there there may be more. Um, I'm sure there may be more. We just need to kind of do do the research, and until then, um, we note that sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and umami and fatty are the basic tastes. Now, Lindsay, I have another fun question for you. It's been interesting planning a few virtual conferences because. In the world of craft beer, even just like a year and a half ago, we weren't seeing the word data much at all. But now I feel data is used, no matter your front of house, back of house, everybody is used the word data. Why do you feel this has happened over the past 15 months? And I obviously would think that you feel this is a pretty strong thing for the industry to grow as a whole. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm a big data fan. Um, I'm a big data fan, but I'm also really pragmatic about it. Um, you know, I, I am, I was just talking to uh, my partner about this. Like I'm a little skeptical of like uh, these, you know, bots and these systems that, and, and I get it. Um, but when it comes to sensory, like uh, I, I think that there's, there's so much information that you can get by just looking at basic numbers. Um, so, I mean, data just gives us a lens into what's happening perceptively. Um, and it helps us to better recognize those trends and identify uh, certain issues. And so um, I do think that we need to utilize data. And if you just take data as like the, the basic definition, like it's just, you know, numbers that represent a certain phenomena, like a, a certain perception in, in our case. And um, if we can use that information to make decisions, then um, all, all the better. Um, you know, it can be used. It, it, if you're, if you can do like meta analysis on your data and it, be really intentional on uh, what information is coming in and the decisions that you're able to make from those, uh, then you know you're kind of off to the races. So what we really need to do as sensory scientists is, is analyze our analysis and um, maybe have a good idea of uh, where are these numbers maybe coming from. Um, I, I mentioned very briefly in, in the talk that really the next step once you flag a problem is to check yourself, is to check, is, is that really true? Is that really the case? Especially with sensory that can be so open to, um, to different stimulus. Um, it's best that we can look at our information and say, okay, well, maybe we saw that um, flag because we put it next to an imperial stout and maybe our panels were fatigued. So we really kind of need to, to put a skeptical eye even on our internal data. And that's actually going to help us gain a lot more respect in our facilities when we can um, really put that stamp on our numbers and not just take it for, um, for what they are. Uh, you, basically, you can't turn off your brain and just look at the, look at the numbers, um, especially in the sensory world. We have to really try to have an understanding of where that's all coming from and use the tools that we have to help us make those decisions. And it can be very powerful. Um, creating, I'm a huge fan of methods that fuel your own database. Um, so if you can create a database of your past products descriptions, and if you can use you know, a common language and, and methods that will help you to see those overlaps in your products, then you can open, you, you just have so much more power when you go to make a new brand and you wanna look at all of your tasting data and say, I wanna make something that tastes like blueberry. What are the what are the tools that I have in my toolbox? And that seems like it's really complicated, but it's not. Um, all you have to do is like tag, the, tag your raw materials and um, use that common language and you can find overlaps. So um, I want to 
to really kind of focus our attention on methodologies that end up working for us in the long run to where we can create um, a, a repository of information to where we can uh, utilize that to make better decisions um, in, in the future rather than just, uh, you know, run run one single test, get a bunch of numbers, make a decision. Um, it's it's better if we can build something that is going to work for us in the future too. So, well, that was, we could talk about that forever. <laughs> we could talk about it forever. I've got one final question for you. I don't think we have any more in the comments. It's been fascinating to watch the rise of non-alcoholic beverages lately. I mean, just all the brands like Athletic, Syria, you know, all the ones that have just kind of exploded the past couple of years and the growth in that segment. Have you seen a lot of century in regard to breweries trying to get a better tasting in a option? Yeah. Um, yeah, we've seen, I mean, it, the, the thing with like NA beer is like it, it's this, it's the same kind of methods of, uh, generating what what it is you're going for. And so with the NA world, if you're trying to kind of emulate alcohol, alcoholic beers, then, um, you know, one would want to build your descriptions or your targets based off of the brands that you're maybe trying to emulate. And so there's, there's a, when you're developing new products, you can kind of decide, do you want to uh, imitate or innovate <laughs> to use like a really tacky thing that just came to my brain. Um, but if you're trying to imitate something, then tasting, uh, the, the products that you're just generally trying to imitate can be helpful. For example, when I was at New Belgium, we were trying to, you know, imitate the flavor of whiskey, uh, when making one of our products. And, uh, this is like, oh, so, so hard. What we did is we tasted a bunch of whiskey and we really defined the flavors that we were getting from whiskey to build the target that we were going for when developing this new product. And so uh, with the NA folks, like if they're, if, if they can taste alcoholic beers and really define what attributes make those brands, those brands, they can use that as a way of validating that they're hitting those target descriptions um, moving forward. So it's kind of the same process. And I've been delighted with some of the NA beers that I've tasted. Um, it, I think they've all kind of come a long way. And I drank one the other day and it was tasty. <laughs> what do you enjoy? Uh, I think it was an athletic beer, but I'm not positive. Uh, I had I had another one from Brew Dog too that I thought was really good too. Um, so I was just kind of tasting a few of them. Um, but yeah, I, I have I had one I had an athletic in my refrigerator and I was like, yeah, it's like malty and stuff. It's nice. <laughs> yeah, they're a nice option to have. Well Lindsay, yeah. I really appreciate you taking the time today to share all your insight. Do you have any final words for everybody listening today or any, you know, if they were to do one thing today, what should that be? Uh, if you're going to do one thing today, uh, go, you know, set, set, set some target description, find what is the product that you sell the most of and uh, pour yourself a taster and um, really intentionally try to create a, a target description for it. Um, try to identify the attributes, the aromas that are in it and, um, you know, use the tool like the beer flavor map to be able to to guide that um, tasting so that you can uh, really start understanding what am I going for? That's really the first step. So just start start um, intentionally tasting the products to build those, those branch targets moving forward and getting other people involved with it. So. Well, thank you so much for everything today, Lindsay. I look forward to hopefully sharing a beer at some point over the year and enjoy your first day back to the new, new normal in San Diego. Crazy. Yeah, yeah. Good I'm luck. excited about it. Yeah, thanks for being here, everyone. And um, like I said, reach out to me, Lindsay at DraftPod.com, and um, you know we're we're active on the social medias too. So pick uh, pick us up there too. Cool. Cheers, everybody. Talk thanks. to you soon. Thanks, guys. Bye.